Hey guys, Alex here. They say that a good start is half the battle won. So today, we would like to talk about introduction to openings, which is actually about the starting of the game and the first couple of moves. Hey, what's up guys? Today we're going to be talking about introduction to openings. So today's topics are the Othello game breakdown, specializing in openings, and of course I'd like to share with you some common openings to the game. So let's talk about the Othello game breakdown. If you think about the rules of the Othello game, Othello is nothing more than a board with 4 initial squares occupied and with 60 empty squares for players to play by taking turns. So. Assuming there are no passes occurring in the game, one would expect to actually play 30 moves in a game. So if you ever heard of a multiple choice question or MCQ, you're basically answering 30 MCQ questions in every game of Othello. And each of these questions would come with at least two or more choices each. So if we just make some simple assumptions and just mathematically derive the, the variations that you can have in Othello um, for at least each player, you would probably face with at least 2 to the power of 30 variations in Othello, which gives you 1,073,741,824 lines possible. Bearing that in mind, let's talk about what is an Othello opening. Let's just broadly define as the 30 moves that you have to play and just split them into three phases with the first 10 moves being the opening. And of course, alternatively, we can also define that book openings are basically where you know that particular opening until. So if you know it until maybe the 8th move or the 7th move, let's just call that your book opening. So book opening is basically a particularly technical term in Othello to describe where a player actually knows that opening. So one of the, the common uh, phrase that we hear, at least for local players in Singapore, say they will ask each other, are you still in book? Are you still in book? What it means is that they are just asking their opponent casually whether they are still within a certain line or variation that they have already memorized and are still in the know of the best move. So of course, when I first started learning Othello, I met experienced players telling me that they actually know certain Othello openings from start to the end. I was like, how can you know all that? But after Spending years uh, playing Othello, I can roughly understand why they would be able to actually build on their experience and memorize or know these lines. So let us now talk about the benefits of memorizing openings. It basically reduces uncertainty by limiting the lines. So instead of having to learn more than a billion lines possible, you would then actually look towards just reducing that uncertainty by restricting the Othello game or your Othello game to certain lines of play. One more benefit about memorizing openings is that it's a consistent approach to mastering Othello. As you play your preferred opening in games, you actually build on that experience in terms of which lines you learn and what moves you know and what type of moves you actually favor compared to others. So the third benefit is that you would then have a better chance against top players who also memorize these openings. Let's now talk about specializing in openings. The pros about specializing in a particular set of openings or just a particular opening is that you ensure consistency. So the second advantage is having a home ground advantage. When I talk about having a home ground advantage, I'm not talking about where you physically are. But instead, when you play an opening line that is only known to you, one analogy that I like to compare to is that, let's just assume that Othello is actually a streetcar race. When you bring your opponent into an opening line that only you are fully aware of, you're basically inviting your opponent into 
a racetrack that only you know exactly where the sharp bends are or where the points where you can actually accelerate and brake and make all the skillful maneuvers to actually optimize your time and achieve the best results. So playing an opening that is uncommon actually gives you that home ground advantage. It actually allows you to throw your opponent off potentially. So this is also why when you play online, you would then see that there are so many players with so many different types of openings. And there is also an increasing trend of players trying to build certain special openings that they like. I would definitely love to share specialized openings in the later episodes. So the third advantage is that your ability to actually go really deep into the book against top players would be enhanced if you know that opening. So let's talk about the cons about specializing in certain opening lines. So first off, if you keep on playing the same variation, when people know who you are and they know which openings you're perfectly capable of, you become predictable over time and they would then be able to actually research and devise a strategy against you. The second disadvantage is you tend to become over-reliant on that particular specialized opening such that maybe you will not be able to play any other openings because you've basically spent too much time just developing that one particular opening. And of course, the third disadvantage is that basically develop lesser ability to counter wide variations, which definitely ties into the second disadvantage that I pointed out. It's always good to actually specialize in certain openings. It's actually advisable for you to also um, learn a wide range of openings to ensure that balance that you have in your game. Let's now talk about common openings. But before we even jump into openings that are fairly common, I would like to share with you some wipeout openings that are also fairly common, at least amongst novice players or intermediate players who actually wish to play a short game and just surprise their opponents. So that is probably something that you want to avoid being wiped out early in the game and ending up with zero disc. So let's just cover a few wipeout openings here. So the first one is actually the rose wipeout opening. So let's just go with c4 being the first move for black. And let's say if you were to play the perpendicular variation and black followed with rose over here and you went with the book move over here. And let's say instead of playing the usual book move to d6 and black plays to d2, which is fairly uncommon. And let's say over here you have a few options to just flip one disc and keep your disc fairly grouped together, you have one, two, three options. And given that the fact that you've learned that having a more compact shape is actually more advantage, you might choose C3, which is definitely the best move over here. However, when black plays to B4, you might be tempted to actually jump into D3 being something that fulfills the three basic principles that we learned, which are group small inside. So this basically flips only one disc, resulting in the overall shape for white being fairly small, and also groups your disc together because it still remains within a group. It's occupying the inside, which is basically the center of the whole group of this. But what happens here for this particular instance is that if you play here into D3 as white, black is given an opportunity to actually play D6 and basically wipes out the entire board, which according to the scoring principles, all the empty squares will go to the winner of the board. So since black has basically 13 discs on the board, the final score is reported at 64-0, which results in your loss. So this is one particular wipeout opening that you want to avoid. So let's just move on to the next wipeout opening that I'd like to share with you. So this is more of the tiger wipeout opening. So again, black starts with c4, you play with a perpendicular opening, and black goes to f6, being the tiger variation, and you play to e6, and black plays to f5, and you play c5, which is a fairly book variation, but over here, instead, black would play 
e2 instead of the usual book of f4 and if black plays e2 you realize you have three discs that are dispersed and you therefore want to play into d6 which only flips one disc in one direction and groups all of your discs together on the inside. In fact, this is actually the best move possible. So over here, black would then set the trap to play c7 which is a bit strange because it's a fairly dispersive diagonal cut across but it still quantifies as a, a centralizing move. So over here, white basically has three obvious options to c6, d7, and e7. So given that the fact that you've learned that the group small inset principles would encourage you to actually keep your groups of discs compact together, playing d7 or e7 actually results in your discs being somewhat more dispersed or in a more long shape, which is not that favorable. So you might be tempted to actually play c6, which is still within the center box of 16 discs, and to basically just flip one disc in one direction and then keep your disc group in the center. So when you play c6 right now, black would effectively be able to wipe you out by playing b6. So let us see what happens next. When black plays b6, white is just left with one disc in the center, which is something that is usually at an advantage for yourself. But for this particular instance, you realize regardless of any of the eight possible directions that you can play to, you can only flip one or a few discs in one direction, which is on the back of your opponent's disc. So if let's say white were to play to b5, black would just simply play a5 and wipe you out and win by 64-0. Similarly, if we go back to that previous position, Consider all the different possible directions over here. If white were to play b3, black would then just play a2 and wipe you out and still win 64-0. So if you just consider all the different directions, all the eight different directions, you will realize black would just follow in that direction and wipe you out. So that is the second wipeout opening that I'd like to share with you. Now let's talk about the third Wipeout opening is basically the cat variation. Black starts with c4, white goes to e3, black goes to f5, white, black, and white to c5. Black to c6 instead of the usual maybe book move to d6. And you as white basically jump in to d6 to basically keep your disc group together and flipping only one disc in one direction. So that's fine, it's definitely still the best move by far. And black plays f6 to wrap up this side. And you play a very simple quiet move, a compact move by playing f3, which is definitely the best move over here and it's reasonable because you only flip one disc in one direction, keep your disc group together, and it's still relatively on the inside. But over here when black plays c3, if you continue that same idea, you basically play d3 which flips one disc in one direction and keeps your disc fairly grouped and compact in the center. Let's see what happens. Black would then play g3 and then you would realize that you basically have three discs that are grouped into the center of the board. But there is no way out for you regardless of which direction you play. You realize you can only flip this in one direction. So for example, if white were to play b4 over here, Black would then capture a4, and then you would be in the same situation in the second wipeout opening whereby you only have one disc in the center of the board, and at the same time there is no way you can actually establish any anchor possible because regardless of which of the eight directions that you choose to play a move to and flip the disc, Black would then just wipe you out and win 64-0. So another possible way is that you might try to play c2 for example. Black would then play b1 that flips basically all the discs over on this side and you're just left with two discs in the center. And regardless of which direction you try to escape, black would then just sweep the discs in that particular direction. And you then realize that you're left with one disc again and no matter how hard you try and which direction you go towards, black will just simply wipe you out and complete the game with 64 to 0. So this is another situation that you want to avoid of getting into. So the first three wipeout openings were actually 
the player playing black who is doing the wipeout. And then right now, I'd like to share a wipeout opening that is being done by the player playing white. So first off, black will go to e6 and white will play a diagonal to f6, followed by a cross back for black and f4 for white. So this is quite a standard uh, diagonal opening. And then black will play to g5 with the heath variation. And white goes to e7 with black going to f7. So over here, this is just quite a normal uh, heath opening variation. White will then cross to g6, and black naturally will go for a cross back with one disc flip and still maintaining the interior shape and group disc. And white goes for the cross down to f8. So if black were to want to continue to maintain the center shape, it's natural that black would want to play to h6 as a cross back. So the setup move over here for the wipeout for white is actually to h4, which again, if black were to want to just jump in to centralize his disc, he would go for h5 and flip the three interior discs, just grouping all his discs together. So it doesn't violate the group small inside principle. So black goes to h5 and white captures h7. So usually when you realize that your opponent is almost seemingly trying to wipe you out, you would then try to be a bit more defensive and try to grab an anchor, which is usually the case of getting an H. So if that were to just think simple and just go for D8, which is a reasonable H grab move, at the same time just flipping one, two discs to actually regroup his discs together, this seems fine. But when white plays an overwhelming move d6 and flips all the discs, you would then realize that black having one disc to d8 does not really give him moves because d7 is an empty square. And at the same time, this entire line here is being occupied. And there is one empty square to e8. So there is no way that black can actually get moves to these three directions. So the only disc that actually provides a move would be g5 and g5 basically gives white uh, opportunity to wipe out if black goes to c5 then white will just grab b5 and the game will then end with black losing 1 to 63 so let us just move back to the position if black were to go to g7 white would then just play g8 and it would still be a wipeout in favor of white and if black were to go for e3, white would simply capture d2 and it would still be game over with the same result. And finally, of course, if black were to go g3, white would also just capture g2. So after covering some wipeout openings, we now want to talk about the common and standard openings in Othello. So the first one I'd like to share is the first 10 moves to the Rose Bill opening. So basically black will start with e6 and perpendicular is one of the more common counter moves for white and white will go to f4 and black will go to c3 and white will just cross back to c4 and black basically crosses back so that process actually repeats until you get this shape followed by white to c2 and black to b3. So this variation is actually quite a standard uh, variation for the Rose Bill opening. Let us now cover another common opening in Othello. So black begins with e6. This first few sequence is fairly similar to the tiger opening. But instead of going to e3 over here for black, black goes to f6. And white goes to c6. And black goes to f5. And finally white cuts down to g5. So this is more of a Stephenson to calm off opening. So just one more side variation to Stephenson is black, white, black, white, black, white, this way, followed by black playing to f6, and instead of white jumping into c6, e7 is also quite a acceptable move for white to play to, and it basically goes into the no kong opening, followed by black, and white over here. So now it will be the rose opening. 
so black goes with e6, white goes to f4, e3 into the center, and white just continues to cut. Black will take a chip to the side at c5, white will center to f3, followed by a cross back for black to c4, and white to regroup to the right at f6, and black and white. So this is basically the rose opening. So now we go into the diagonal opening. So black begins with e6, white to f6, black just jumps into the cross, and white goes for f4, and usually there are quite a few variations over here, we'll just cover the most common one being the cow opening, which is uh, basically black going to e3, and then we'll talk about white crossing back first over here, followed by black c4, white to e7, black regrouping back to c6, and white to e2. So this is basically the Tanida opening, but it's also known as the sailboat opening. So let's talk about another diagonal opening variations with black going to e6, f6, black, white, black, but instead of crossing over to c5, white goes to d6, and Black goes to g4, and white goes to d3, and black goes to c3, and finally white goes to h3. So that's one of the basic variations of the chimney opening. So with that, we've basically covered a couple of common openings in Othello. And of course, this list of openings over here is by no means uh, exhaustive. There are at least more than a hundred known openings and definitely a lot of sub variations that one could explore. So feel free to go ahead and explore and just try to figure out your way into any openings that fits your style of play. Thank you very much for watching my video again and I'll see you at the next episode.